Bocock and welcome to Between the Covers. David Baldacci is an international number one best-selling author. He's published more than 40 novels in 45 languages and with 150 million copies worldwide. That includes some of his most popular series, John Puller, The Camel Club, and King and Maxwell. Several of his books have been adapted for television and film. He's also published novels for young readers. And along with his wife, he is the co-founder of the Wish You Well Foundation, a nonprofit supporting literacy across America. He has a new book in the Atlee Pine thriller series. The title is Mercy. David Baldacci, thank you so much for being here. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. I can't wait to get into the new book. It's called Mercy. This is the fourth Atlee Pine book. Now, Atlee is an FBI agent, and briefly, 30 years ago, her twin sister, Mercy, was kidnapped from their family home. So take it from here, if you can. Who is Atlee? This is the fourth book with Atlee. So, yeah, Adley Pine, she's been an FBI agent for a number of years. She's stationed in Arizona in the Grand Canyon area. In the first novel, Long Road to Mercy, she solves a case, and but she understands she has a lot of personal baggage. She comes to the decision that for her to move forward with her life, she's got to have closure on her sister's, you know, whereabouts. Is she alive? Is she dead? So she goes on an odyssey with her assistant, Carol Blum, through the book A Minute to Midnight, then the third novel, Daylight, and then it culminates in Mercy to find her sister because she understands she can't move forward in her life until she has closure about Mercy. And so everything is directed towards finding out what happened to her sister. Is she alive or is she dead? Well, we find out in the book. Um, the female characters, all of your female characters are these really powerful, strong women. So there are no damsels in distress in, in, in your book. And, Tell me about writing strong women and writing from a woman's point of view. So I grew up surrounded by strong female role models. Both of my, my paternal and maternal grandmother lived with, lived with us for the last 10 years of their life. My mother was a force of nature. She grew up in the middle of coal country in Dickinson County, Virginia. It's the poorest and the, and the youngest county in Virginia. She, lived, she grew up in a place called Ramsey's Ridge. In 2004, the Washington Post wrote an article about it. The only thing noteworthy about it was in 2004, they brought, finally brought electricity and running water to Ramsey's Ridge in 2004. My mom grew up there in the 30s and 40s, the youngest of 10 kids. I married a very strong, independent woman. Uh, we raised a very strong, independent daughter. And that's really all I, my whole experience has been that way. Again, I know no damages and distress. Um, and so I'm comfortable writing about women because I've been watching and observing and living with them uh, across many levels, many degrees, most of my life. Um, and so when I, it comes down to creating these type of characters, particularly women in, in law enforcement, which is a much, still a much a male dominated arena. You know, I know a lot of women who work for the FBI and the Secret Service and different agencies, and they have to work three times as hard to get to the same level as men. That's just the way the playing field is tilted. Which actually comes out in the book because Atlee does have to work twice, three times as hard as the men to get where she is. We learn pretty quickly that Mercy is alive. She's living under a different name. And I'm not spoiling anything for anyone who hasn't read the book yet because this comes out really fast. Mercy is, she's working as a security guard and a part-time MMA fighter. Now, honestly, you don't get any tougher than this. So I kind of want to know about how you wrote this, how you researched these fight scenes. Um, this is brutal. Yeah, I know. I was, you know, when I, I played football and wrestled in high school, I wrestled in college. I did Greco Roman wrestling um, as well and went in a lot of tournaments across the country. So I'm used to really hand to hand style kind of combat um, and one on one. Um, and I, with, with Mercy's character, it wasn't gratuitous why I made her what she was. She doesn't want to have any close friends because she's worried about being discovered. She wants to be self sufficient. She's tall and rangy and strong, so she wanted to use those attributes as well to earn money. And one of the ways in our society, you know, whether you like it or not, um, is to use your body as sort of a way to make money. And 
with her being athletic and strong and all that, you know, the UFC, the MMA was the route to go. You know, she can make up to a thousand dollars a night in a fight if she wins. And for her, that's really, really good money. Uh, but it also represents that she is a very, <clears throat> she's a loner and she relies on her strength in order to survive. And I didn't think there could be any, any better way to symbolize that than to have her literally fighting for her survival. Now, I don't know, and you don't have to answer, I don't know if this is the final book in the Atlee Pine series, but I'm reading this book and I'm thinking, there could be actually another character that comes out of this that maybe could have her own book. Yes, it was. And I was thinking about that when I created that character, who's also complicated, you know, it's sort of in the gray area, which is the world I live in, neither black nor white. And a number of people have said the same thing to me. She seems to be really, really intriguing. And even though she's, you know, she's not a peripheral character, she's pretty integral. She's not a major character on the same level as the two Pine sisters. But oh yeah, no, I, she's in my back pocket. I know she's there. Oh, good, good. <laughs> okay. You are so darn good at descriptions. I mean, I'm, I'm reading this. I'm actually feeling what you're describing. And case in point, here is Mercy in, in the beginning of the book. She's thinking about her young life when she was kidnapped. And I wonder if you would treat us to reading part of this. She talks about how she didn't have the, the fairy tale Cinderella life. And, and if you could kind of pick it up from there. Absolutely. She grew tall, very tall. Her parents must have been tall. She couldn't remember. And her life had made her strong. She could lift a truck and she possessed stamina out the roof, able to work for days and not feel it. Not an ounce of fat was on her frame because they fed her just enough to keep her hungry. And her pain tolerance, what she'd endured tonight, it was painful for sure, but nothing really compared to what she'd endured in the past. Desiree had really liked to burn dogs, cats, but mostly L, her. And mentally, she was stronger than she otherwise ever would have been. Every day the same. First, the locked room of the house. Then her final destination was the little prison in the woods, another fairy tale with a monster attached, the chain, the smell of rotting clay. She stayed focused and her mind survived it. Played the mental games required not to lose her sanity. She obsessed over mundane stuff so she could totally bury the absurdity of her current existence in the black hole of her mind while she doted over minutia, the counting of seconds, the drip of water, the arrangement of her rag clothes on her grimy shelves, the cleaning of dishes, the fixation on just where to place the first cut on a tree limb, or the sighting of a fawn that drove her to tears, or the spying of a hawk, enjoying the lift of air currents along with the best view in the county, a bird with more freedom than she had. Each day she was alive to see the sun rise and then fall was an enormous victory. It truly was the little things, particularly when all the big things had been denied you. The long days and nights of labor, the knock-knock on the door for her two daily meals, her with the food, him eventually with the gun, because she had grown far bigger than both of them. They were afraid of her. She could see that in her wide eyes and how Joe clutched the weapon, how the vein at his temple bulged when that door and that damn door stayed open. Never seeing another living soul except the scaredy cat Joe and the bug-eyed and vicious Desiree, and occasionally Lynn and Wanda, who would come with sad eyes and leave with sadder ones. Kane had passed from terrified kid to cool-eyed adult. She was a prisoner even though she'd never been tried and convicted of anything until that day came. Thank you. This is a little girl prisoner. As a reader, as a mother, it was a really hard to, to read this. And as I said, your descriptions are so good. So that begs the question, how are you so good? Are you a careful observer of people? Do people tell you things? Do you make mental notes? How do you do research on something like that? I think that one attribute that every writer needs to have, they need to be ever forever curious about life and the world. So, you know, when I was a kid, I was the kid in our neighborhood who was designated to come up with all of our adventures we could have after school and during the summer. The battles we would fight, the odysseys we would take, the journey we were on, it was kind of fun stuff for me to just create the stuff out of nothing. And I was sort of a Harriet the Spy type. When I was a kid, I eavesdropped on conversations. I loved to watch people, and that's continued my whole life. So writers need to be curious about life. So I go out every day, and people ask, where do you get your ideas? I wake up every day, I walk out the door, and I learn something that day that I didn't know the day before. 
So I'm a voracious reader. I absorb information from all corners. I feel like the more you know about lots of different subjects, then all of a sudden you can take elements from those different thought pots and start weaving original stories together. So for me, it's all about you know not staring at my cell phone when I'm walking down the street, but just watching people. I love seeing how they interact, how they talk, how they don't talk to each other, how they move, how they get on a bus. The guy gets on a bus with a package. I wonder where he's going, what's in the package. It's asking yourself questions and then in the story, answering those questions. Um, and when I go out and research, you know, I talk to lots of people. I become a journalist. I ask good questions. And I listen. listen. Listening is a really lost art. It's a lost art and, and it is a, a great trait to have. You know, David, you have had tremendous success, no question, a worldwide following. So the story is that you write this first book, you hit it out of the park, it's an overnight success. Is that true? Yeah, yeah it, but it only took me 6,000 nights to get there. <laughs> so they don't, they don't know about the, you know, the years and years of writing short stories and trying to get to the public, trying to write screenplays and get those on the screen and trying to struggle through a first novel. It took three years because I was writing full time. I was writing or working full time as a trial lawyer in Washington, D.C. But every writer who's made it through that gauntlet has the same sort of story to tell that I have. You know, they found time to write, you know, either early in the morning, late at night. They're working full time. They have to make a living. They can't make a living off the writing. They're trying to learn the craft. It fits and starts, rejections, and a little bit of hope here and there keeps you going. So. It's not so much different from other writers, you know, journeys that they've taken. This is a craft. It's not anything you're ever going to master. You're going to be an apprentice for life. And all you can help do with every story, every book, is try to get a little bit better than you were before. But it also didn't hurt that the book Absolute Power was a bestseller than a hit movie with Clint Eastwood and Gene Hackman. That's pretty darn good. All the moons were in alignment on that one. Right? <laughs> let me tell you, I've done a lot of work in Hollywood. I've had a bunch of stuff done and a bunch of stuff not done. And that is very unusual, all things like that, to come together the way they did. It's not, that's not usually how it works out. I'm glad it worked that way, though, for you. You just said you were a trial attorney. So what I understand, you were like most uh, attorneys who become successful writers. They are the lawyer during the day and the writer at night, which means you're probably never sleeping. But I'm guessing that law may have been a good foundation, what was it? Well, look, I, you know, I've been friends with Scott Trow and John Griffin for years, and other Lisa Fatalini, you know, writers turn, lawyers turn writer. As a, as a lawyer, all I had in my quiver uh, were works. You know, those were my chief tools, my chief weapons. Either I was writing a brief, I was speaking them orally in court in front of a judge or a jury, and it made you think about building a story. I, I like to say tongue in cheek, some of the best fiction I ever wrote was when I was a lawyer. <laughs> you know. I had the same set of facts as the other side, and I had to build a story that was diametrically opposed to what they were arguing, you know? So words are really important to me. I remember writing a brief uh, about a long-arm jurisdiction case in, in Texas where we were trying to get somebody to be sued in Texas. And they say they didn't have enough presence or connection to Texas so we couldn't sue them there. And I wrote the brief, and I agonized over the verb to use. And finally, I decided to use the verb flitted. I said, there's no there's no justice in this in this defendant being able to flit in and out of the great state of Texas in order to avoid the consequences of misdeeds they've committed in the state. And I know that word really resonated with the judge because we won that we won that case, we won that order, and when he issued the order, he used the word flitting in his <laughs> order. Um, so trust me, words do matter. <laughs> We're going to put that on a bumper sticker. Was there a day that you said, yes, I can give up law, I'm going to write full time? Well, I, I, I sold the rights to absolute power. Nobody in my law firm knew I was writing anything. So after I got the news that the book had sold at auction for an enormous amount of money, I had to go on, keep on working. Um, so I remember I attended a, a luncheon that day about um, insurance regulations. You know, So I'm listening to this guy drone on and on about insurance regulations. I have this super secret that I'm dying to tell. All I wanted to do was jump on the table and do the electric slide all the way down the table. <laughs> That's all I wanted to do. But so the movie rights sold, international rights sold. It was just an enormous amount of money. People I didn't even know were like chucking checks at me as fast as they possibly could. My wife and I sat down. We had one child at that time, another one on the way. And I said, I'm going to keep working as a lawyer. 
um, until this new book is just about to come out. I'm going to see. I'm going to. I'm writing my next book too. I didn't know Absolute Power was going to sell. I'd already started my second novel. But I said, as we get close to publication, I really think I can build a career as a writer. And if I can't, if I fall on my face, I can always go back to being a lawyer. I've got I've got good skills and good reputation. So it was probably around you know April of 1995, around that time, that I left the practice of law. Uh, my book was published in January of the next year, and I haven't looked back, you know, 50 books and counting. 50 books and counting. When I open your books, and it's like, I want to say it's like it's hitting the ground running because it's so action-packed, but that really doesn't even do it justice. There is an adrenaline rush. So I'm curious, when you're writing a series especially, do you see the characters evolving from book to book? And, and do you look at new characters as, in a particular book as, oh, maybe I have another series? That happens all the time to me. Um, I, there's no reason to bring a character back in a new book in a series if it's just to investigate another mystery. Um, I mean, some writers do that, but I don't think it's a compelling enough reason for me. So like an Amos Decker, every book that he's in, you, I peel more layers off the onion for him. New things, new revelations about it come. You learn more than you knew in the last book. So for me, it's always about the case he has to solve, but also about who the man is underneath. And I'm working on a new Amos Decker book right now, and you're gonna learn a lot more about him, and I'm putting through a lot more change in his life, which he hates, absolutely hates. So for me, it's all about the evolution of the character as well, is whatever mystery they're supposed to uh, be investigating. And then sometimes, you know, when, I, when I'm writing a novel and I, and I see a character over there on the periphery and all of a sudden they start to grow room a little bit larger because I think they're interesting and I want to bring them in more into the story, then my mind sort of goes, ding, you know, maybe that's a possible series character down the road that I can bring back. That always happens. I, I love the series because I feel like it's peeling back the layers of an onion as I get to know a particular character better. And there is action, there's excitement in your books, there's also authenticity. And for some reason, we gravitate to these stories that have violence and murder and evil. So you're writing them. Why do we have this fascination? I like to call it the safe scare. Uh, mentality. You know, when you're a little kid, you're afraid of the boogeyman. You don't want to look under the bed or look in the closet, but you do because, you know, you're fat, you're more fascinated than you are scared. So when we grow up, we don't really lose that at all. We have this fascination with, say, for instance, serial killers. Nobody in their right mind would want, would want to meet Ted Bundy, not even in a dark alley, but in, like in the middle of a football stadium. Nobody would want that. But do we want to read about somebody like that from a safe distance? Yeah, because we're fascinated with there, but for the grace of a couple of chromosomes, go I. So you want to know what made that person a monster, what makes that person tick, how can they do those sorts of things. It's just an innate fascination with humanity, really, at all levels. So I, I call it the safe scare, where people want to know about these things without ever meeting them or experiencing them in the real life. It's, it's the scare, but from a safe distance. I love being scared from a safe distance. Thank you for that. Do you always know how the story is going to end? And I mean, when you sit down at the, and I am assuming computer, um, do you know right then and there how it's ending? Never. I never know the ending of a novel before I start it. Um, I, I know a lot of my friends outline, you know, they outline everything and then you sit down and write the novel. I've tried that. It never works for me. Nothing I ever put in the outline ends up in the novel. So it's sort of a waste of time for me. I give the analogy of if you want to learn how to drive a Formula One race car, you can do it a couple of ways. You can take a class and read a book, or you can drive a Formula One race car, and they're totally different experiences. So when you write the outline, you're not engaged with the characters yet. They're really not doing anything other than, you know, here's what's going to happen in this chapter and all that. So there's no sense of urgency. There's no sense of like, oh, my God, this decision really matters. But when you're writing the novel and you're in the middle of a very dangerous situation, you know, it's almost a difference between planning for a battle and actually fighting the battle. Because when you're immersed in the trenches and things are happening to your character, you have to make decisions. It's almost like everything slows down. You, your mind has great clarity. You see everything. It's like Tom Brady dropping back for a pass. He sees every person on the field, all 22 players, including himself, all the sight lines, all the passing lines, all the defensive ends coming around to wreck him, everything. The spot where he's going to throw the ball as soon as the receiver turns towards it. 
Um, that for me is where the storytelling really comes in. My mind moves at a different level. My synapses are firing off at a, at a much greater velocity. And I see everything. I never would during the course of the drafting an outline. You know, it takes me 50 pages just to understand who my characters are, much less trying to create them and have a connection with them in an outline. Um, so for me, it's very much an organic process. That makes me feel so good to know that that's how you write. I, I mean, I, it makes me just appreciate it even more. There is a nod to libraries in Mercy, and I have to say libraries hold a very special place in, in my heart. Elle, who has had very little formal schooling, learns through librarians, which I, I love that you did that. Do you have a personal connection to libraries? Libraries really saved my life and they changed who I am. Um, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia in the 60s and 70s, a heavily segregated society. I grew up with a lot of people whose opinions and perspectives on life have been changed since that time. Um, I never had a chance to travel. Mark Twain had a very famous quote. I'm on the board of the Mark Twain house. I've been a Twainiac most of my life. The quote was, he was the most traveled man of his generation. He traveled the world on the speaking engagements. The quote is, travel is fatal to prejudice. I would modify it slightly to saying there are many ways to travel. I traveled not physically, but I traveled through books at the library. I went to the library and I learned about people who didn't look like me, dress like me, speak like me, pray like me. But I learned that we all had a common core of humanity. And it made me more empathetic, more tolerant, more understanding, less opinionated. And it made me just a better person. You know, the librarians that I would go to in Richmond, Virginia, they all knew me and my brother and sister. They would let me check out more books than I was supposed to because they knew I would read them all and come back the next day or the next week for more. So books really allowed me to become the person who I am. And I will tell you that if more people went to the library and more people read books, what a far better world we would have. I, I totally agree with you. And it was only a small part in the book that, that Elle does this, but boy, did, did it, it just hit me just really right. You yourself have long supported libraries and literacy efforts through your foundation, wish you well. And I, I would love if you could tell me about that. So this is actually our 20th year. My wife and I founded it uh, 20 years ago. When I first started out on my own, publicity tours, a lot of my events were sponsored by libraries, friends of the library, literacy organizations. So I got a crash course over a couple of years about how bad the illiteracy problem is in the United States. We're about half the adult population. And I'm not just, I'm not talking about all ESLs, I'm talking about Native Native Americans. About half the adult population read at the two lowest levels of literacy. <clears throat> 50 or 60 million are functionally illiterate. Another 50 or 60 million would be hard pressed to read a grocery list. Um, so reading for me is the same verb to read is the same verb to think you can't do one without the other you know how can you decide things if you can't process information if you can't read information and and process it in your head and make the decision so it's not just about reading the next baldacci book on the beach it's about being an active participant in a democracy you know how do you make good decisions at the voting booth if you don't know the issue you know our world now is filled with more disinformation than I have ever seen in my entire life. And the people who are not well read, the people who don't read at all, are much more likely, and I'm not saying this myself, and yet study after study has proven this, are much more likely to fall victim to disinformation campaigns and to be fed lies. Um, so for me, it's this is how we maintain our democracy. If people are well educated, well read, lots of good things happen. If they're not, lots of bad things happen. Wish You Well is the name of your foundation. It's also the title of this beautiful book that you wrote as a standalone, and I believe it is, it's your mother's story. And it, it, we talked a tiny bit about this in the beginning of the show, but these were stories that she remembered from her childhood. Is that true? She grew up in the middle of coal mining country in Southwest Virginia, uh, the youngest of 10, and a very hard scrabble life. And I visited her whole homestead many times when I was a kid, on top of the mountain, most remote, hairpin curve, you never want to drive up there. My dad was a big, strong guy. And when he got to the bottom of the mountain to go to my mom's house, she had to drive. He was too scared to drive it because it was like one lane, hairpin turn, 3,000 foot drop. And she drove up there like it was, she was in the middle of a six lane highway in Los Angeles. So um, the, the story was really about how, you know, how she grew up. The story itself was fictionalized. 
Um, I actually adapted the screenplay for film. It starred Ellen Burstyn uh, and Josh Lucas. And I remember interviewing my mother for this, you know, I wanted her to tell me about it like 50 years before, right? And she recounted it in such vivid detail. I finally had to ask her, Mom, I can't even remember what I had for lunch yesterday. You know, how do you remember these things in such incredible detail half a century later? And her, you know, her, her answer was simple, but right to the point. She said, honey, when you grow up like that, you can never forget. And um, that was the answer. And he was right. And, you know, interviewing her uh, allowed me to write about that way of life, a way of life that happened when I wasn't even born in such authentic and vivid detail. Um, and I owe that to my mom's memory and her recollection. It was just spot on. Thank you. The latest book, Mercy, is a thrill ride. David Baldacci, this has been such a pleasure. I can't wait for the next book. So congratulations on the work <laughs> that you and Michelle do with the Wish You Well Foundation. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I'm Ann Bocock. Please connect with us. You can listen to our podcast, Go Between the Covers, wherever you get your podcast, and join us on the next Between the Covers. <laughs>